Good morning, everyone. Uh, how are you on this Father's Day? Well, are you comfortable in here? Is it is it stuffy? Is it too hot? Is it it's okay? It's always a dangerous question because you get one half of the room nice and comfy, and the other half not so. And what do I do then? <laughs> uh, Ed, yeah. Well, welcome this morning. Uh, I get yes on this Father's Day, and um, uh, it's it's a day that you know. Obviously, we we want to stop and we want to pause, and we will this morning. We will we'll break from our our, our study in uh, Philippians and uh, consider what it is to be a father, and um, and maybe some other things. I don't know. We'll see where we go. But it's true, isn't it? It's true enough to say that Father's Day, and it needs to be said, is that it's, it's not easy for everyone. And because uh, some of us may not have had the father that we should have had, and some of us may not have had a father present at all. Uh, we understand these things, and that is a great tragedy, not only for us, but it's a great tragedy for our society as a whole, and uh, because... Fathers are of the utmost importance within our homes and our communities, and uh, that is that is so clearly evident. Um, but for the most part, for the most part, uh, and for most of us in this room, this is a this is a good day, isn't it? You know, this is a day where we pause to reflect and to remember, to pay tribute to, to honour those men that have been, or should have been, or hopefully are the most important men within our lives and so today is a day for most of us that is filled with warmth with comforting thoughts and uh, and wonderful memories um, but those uh, these things are true but they, they, this is something that's also true and every dad in this room will testify of this and that is simply that you know to be a father to be a Christian father I've got to specify that to be a Christian father um, takes commitment and it takes courage and I believe we need to have a, a great uh, commitment to this this vocation that God has called us to as fathers and indeed it does take great courage you know and it means that we stand up for what we believe doesn't it as as, as believers and uh, uh, again it's been often said it's it is it isn't the easiest thing to be a father these days um, And I don't think it's ever been easy, to be honest. And I can't leave you mums out because it's, it's not easy being a mother, is it? Let's be honest here. It isn't an easy thing. For that fact, it isn't easy for being, being a kid, especially today. <laughs> right? Isn't that true? You know? It's, it's, it's never really been... So it, it doesn't matter... On Father's Day, I don't think it really it matters... Um, what role we have been or we have in the family unit um, life. It was Malcolm, who, if I said Malcolm Fraser, who, who would, who, yes, there's a few of us that are old enough, right? It, 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 we remember, yeah. It was Malcolm Fraser who coined the phrase, or didn't coin the phrase, he quoted um, he, he quoted George Bernard Shaw. Remember that? Who knows what the phrase is? I'll put you to the next test. That this is what we were. Who, who knows? Anybody? Oh, there it is. Yes. Life wasn't meant to be easy. But the thing about Fraser, when he quoted that George Bernard Shaw, he only quoted half of the saying. Because what George Bernard Shaw said was, he said, life wasn't meant to be easy, but take courage, it can be delightful. Yes. How much better is that? <laughs> but take courage, it can be delightful. I like that because I love being a father. I love being a father, right? I know I'm not the greatest dad in the world. I, I, know, I know at least two dads that are greater than me, and that are my two sons. And, you know, and it's a great joy seeing them fathering their children. It's a great joy to know that, well, well, quite frankly, me at their age was a disaster, you know. 
And they bless my, they bless my heart every time I see them with their children. I, I love being a dad. And, and, and again, not the greatest dad, but my kids have said that to me. Dads, anybody? Have you heard those words come from your children? Or have you got a mug that says it at least? A T-shirt? <laughs> no, I'm not the greatest dad, but I do know the importance that it is for us dads to be good dads, right? You know, the, the tragic thing is that we're living in a society now where people are saying that we don't even necessarily need dads, right? It's just a tragic thing, you know. Of course, uh, IVF came along years ago and, and told us that we don't necessarily even need a dad to be present, right? And of course, in more recent times, we had this whole struggle with the marriage and gender laws and all of that, that, that tell us that, you know, that mums and dads, well, there's no real difference between them at all. A and again, a home where there is a dad absent, maybe two mums are there, then that's just as good. We're, we're told that, right? But of course, there is a great difference, isn't there? And you, this audience, doesn't need me to tell you that. There's an incredible difference between mums and dads, between the, you know, the distinct... We're wired differently. And everybody knows that. Innately, everybody knows that. But there is this influence in society today that brings us to this place where we're afraid to even... We can become afraid to even um, represent something that we innately know is not true. And that is that there is no difference between us. We all know that. Everybody knows that. You know? We are wired completely different. Not only did God you know, give us distinct roles in his creative purposes. But again, he's wired us uniquely to be able to fulfill those, those roles. You know, he, he made us with certain abilities and characteristics that are very different from one another, right? Again, you don't need me to go into those things. But physically and emotionally, we are equipped completely different from one another to fulfill those very unique roles as father and mother that God has called us to. And I would say to us men today... If we are married and we have children, then the two most important roles that God has called us to is simply that, to be a husband and to be a, a father. What I want to read to you this morning is, I haven't told you, have I yet? Yeah, Psalm 128. Um, if I have a sip of water, is either of these mine? Uh, who am I sharing it with? Okay. Um, let me just read it to you if you're, if you're heading there. Or it's on the screen, I believe. Psalm 128, first verse. It says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat, at the la at the, when you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy and you should be well, and it shall be well with you. I've got to put glasses on. I'm going to start again. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine. In the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants. All around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. So that first verse, blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. The blessed man. The, the, the truly happy man is the man who fears the Lord, is what the psalmist plainly tells us. Is the man who has a reverential, we like to say, a reverential awe before God, before his majesty, before his holiness. He is the majestic creator, the all-powerful God of heaven and earth. We have a reverential awe before him, right? He is our... well. well so the psalmist tells us, because it's addressed to a dad, isn't it? 
Clearly, that is clearly because it's talking about wives and, and so on. And so here, very simply, dad, dads, we need to revere or live in reverential awe before God. That's the starting point here. We take God, that means we take God seriously as men of God within our homes, right? We recognize that He is that 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 He is holy and that He is worthy even as we sang this morning of all glory, of all honor, of all praise. And we and He must be, this is what it's saying, He must be the very center of everything that we are. This is addressed to fathers. He must be the centre of everything that we are. Now, certainly everything that I say today applies to every Christian. But you understand that the psalmist here is addressing fathers. And he opens up by declaring that we should make God the very centre of everything, third time, everything that we are. He is, again, our starting point. That's why it says there, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. So we begin with God's ways. What are God's ways? Where do we find God's ways? We begin with God's ways. It means we think and we behave biblically. That's where God's ways are revealed to us. Isn't that right? We think and we behave biblically. The blessed state of life is the product of a life that is lived in the will of God. You know what we call that? I know this is James's favourite word. We call that obedience. That's what that is. You know, if we truly, and, and this is so important. It might, I know it's basic, but it's so important. If we truly revere God, again, if we take Him seriously regarding his holiness and i promise you obedience is not a difficult thing obedience isn't a problem if that's who it's who, who we recognize god to be in fact it will be the natural desire of your life to obey him obedience only becomes a struggle when a person does not take god seriously that's when obedience becomes a problem that's, that's why we say, well, that's why we often say that you know, our beliefs determine our behavior. If we believe God to be holy, if we reverence God because of we, know, we know who he is, because we surrender to his majesty and his sovereignty, then what we believe about him will determine the behavior or the life that we live. Believe in a holy God and your desires, and your actions will be a desires towards holiness, right? But don't believe in a holy God. Don't truly understand the nature and the character of who God is and what his word declares about him. Don't believe in a holy God, then your actions and your desires will respond accordingly. See, the psalmist, again, is talking about a man who is a worshipping father here. A father who lives in devotion before his creator. He's talking a man who is blessed because he walks with God. He's talking about a life of worship. Again, a life of worship and devotion before the Holy One. And and I love that it says there in that verse, that second verse, where you eat, did you notice that? Did it seem to fit? Where you eat the labor of your hands, sorry, when you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy and it shall be well with you. Think about this. Sometimes we don't necessarily see God's blessing. Sometimes we can't see God. Sometimes we, don't even, we, can't, we find it difficult to recognize God working in some of the circumstances of our lives at all, right? Sometimes we feel very much like that. But, but the blessed man, the man who fears the Lord, the man who is walking in God's ways, This man trusts God, even in the dark places. This man trusts God. This man knows that God will provide. He always has done. He always will do. And even in this dark place where I find it very difficult to recognize his presence or recognize his hands moving at all, this man knows that God will provide, right? What does he know? 
This man knows that he can trust God. This man knows that God has called us to the vocation. Well, we all know this, right? Whatever the vocation of life may be, we know that God has called us to that. We know that God is the one who is, has called us, chosen us. God is the one who has opened up the doors of opportunity before us. He is the one who has ordered our steps. He is the one. He is the one who helps us succeed. This man knows that. We all know that, right? But we need to remember that God's idea of prosperity, this is where we get into trouble, right? Because we need to understand that God's idea of prosperity and success is not really measured by the standards that we see that are held up before us in this world around us. That's why it's, that's why it's been well said, you know, and whatever we do without God, have you heard this? You should have. Whatever we do without God, we will either fail miserably or succeed miserably. Whatever we do without God. You know? The truly blessed state comes from doing things God's way and the psalmist says here when you obey God he will reward your labors you will be happy and it will be well with you as we read in that verse so the idea is this you're going to have security you will have security you will be satisfied you'll have a clear conscience why because you believe that God is a holy God and you honour that God and your life is a reflection of who you see God to be, right? Who you know him to be. You know that all is well between you and your God. What a wonderful state of being that is, isn't it? It doesn't matter really what the circumstance is. It doesn't really matter that. But because you know who God is and you trust him and you honour him, and you reflect his holiness in the way that you treat one another, isn't it amazing? It doesn't matter how dark the clouds are around you. It doesn't matter what circumstance is. It doesn't matter. When you turn the light off at the end of the day and you lay your head upon that pillow, there is rest within your soul and within your mind. Isn't that right? You know that, don't you? It's the blessed state. It's how we live as believers. Right? So he says to this person, to this husband, he says, your wife, in verse 3, shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. This is what I believe about every Christian woman. And feel free to correct me when I'm wrong, okay? Feel free to jump in. But I believe that every Christian woman wants their husband, the father of their children, to be the spiritual leader of their home. Look at that. No one's rushing the stage to drag me off. Isn't that an amazing thing? Husbands, please, will you take note of that response? I invited every woman in this room including the wife that you're sitting next to, to protest violently if what I said was wrong. And I'm going to say it again, just for your benefit, husbands. I believe that every Christian woman wants her man, her husband, to fear God. I didn't say that, did I? And to walk in his ways. That's different. Nobody's rushing the stage. What did I say? Are we good? Okay, we're good. They want the husbands, the father of their children, to be, this is what I said, to be the spiritual leaders in their homes. Right? You see, there's a natural progression that is laid out in this psalm. It is. It's fear the Lord. It's worship him. It's walk in his ways, take him seriously, trust that he will provide, and then your wife will be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. It's a very natural progression that is laid out for us to take notice of. Sadly, there are many men, none in this room, 
But there are many men who want their wives to simply submit to them, but they don't realize that unless they are godly men, unless they fear the Lord, unless they walk in God's ways and spiritually provide for their family, unless they take God seriously, then their wives will never feel safe. Their wives will never feel secure in that marriage relationship, right? Notice God likes her or likens her to be a fruitful vine here, right? I mean, what's the vine? The vine, we all know this, it is a, is a tender plant that needs to be what? It needs to be supported, doesn't it? It needs to be lifted up. It needs to be supported. It needs to be cherished and it, need, it, it needs to be well, cherished as a valuable plant for which it is. You know, it has to have something to support it. And guess who that support in the family is? Here we are, husbands. Here we are, dads. The psalmist is talking about a man who can be as strong as the wall of the house here. Um, yet he supports her and is tender towards her so that she can be fruitful in that relationship. Do you hear those things? As strong as the walls of the house, yet he supports her and is tender towards her so that she can be fruitful in that relationship. God's husbands are sensitive. We don't say that, do we, anymore? I hope we do. God's husbands are sensitive they are loving and they are supportive men who fear God and walk in his ways. That's a Christian man. Huh? And then it says, your children. It says, your children are like olive plants all around your table. Now, the person who owned olive plants and olive trees, they owned something of incredible value. This is what you've got to recognize here, right? Because olive plants and olive trees could provide fruit not only for that generation, but how long does an olive tree live for? Long time, right? So the idea is that olive plant and olive trees can provide fruit for, for Fruit, fruit for, for income for 20, for 30, even more generations is the idea. And the psalmist is talking about a man who is loving and sensitive and caring towards his children. This is a dad who, who loves God. This is the dad who passes on takes the time to pass on to the next generation, that the generation beyond it might be valued. And so he recognises the value of the heritage that he has to pass on to his children. Look, I, I stand at so many gravesides. I, part of my job in aged care is, is, is I get to do that. You know? And one of the things I nearly always say towards the end of a ceremony is that the final duty that we have is to take the richness of the heritage that has been given to us and to walk with it from this place to ensure that the next generation is as blessed, if not more, and stronger than the one that has just passed. You know? And that's why I say I love to look at my children, my boys, and see them at their stage of life being so far more advanced when it comes to the things of being a father and being a husband than I was at their age. That's the idea here. It's the richness of it. It's, it's, it's treasured. That heritage is something that is valued. It's so much more than a few, you know, quaint sayings that, you know, that we always say to our children. This is what my dad said to me and I'm saying it to you, son. Off you go. You know. So much more than that, right? No. And note that these children are described here as tender olive plants. So again, it's like the vine. They need to be brought up with, with uh, respect and love. They need... And many scriptures talk to us about parenting, how we as, as fathers are not to provoke our children, we're not to e exasperate them, we're not to fr frustrate them, but rather to bring them up, it says here, like a tender 
olive plant, love them and show them the respect that is due to them. The man, to, to, to teach them to carry the mantle that they are going to take forward from their experience as a child into the relationship of a father and show them the way, right? You know, the school system has your children five days a week. Um, how many hours these days? I don't know. Is it seven hours a day? Uh, your school children have you, your, your, the school system has your children five days a week, seven hours a day. Is it really six six hours a day? And there are statistics that are often quoted when we consider these things, and I don't know how accurate they are. But when we talk about fathers within the home, in many instances, it's you know that close personal intimate period of time where a father is is part is is passing on and participating in their child's life in many instances it's down to minutes a week and that's a great tragedy isn't it 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 really it really is and we we wonder why the generation of today the youth generation of today behaves the way that they do we must dad we must live godly lives we must model before our families the love and the character and the cares that God shows us. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's not only, is it? It's not only this, the school system. You know, I, I, all us old people say the same thing, right? We, we would hate to be kids today. Now, we love our kids. We really do. But we would hate to be growing up. See, I grew up as a kid. I grew up in the 70s, right? And... And I look back upon the 70s as incredibly free times, you know. Um, but, you know, this is the thing that, that I struggle with, is that with every child, almost every child today, you know, it carries with them a portal into a world that is designed or has algorithms designed to attach themselves to things, attach these kids to things that you, you have no knowledge of, you know. Of course, I'm talking about social media, I'm talking about phones and things like that. You know. And it's so very important, right? So very important, especially for fathers. I was looking at some statistics and they talked about I'm going to, oh, this could be dangerous because this is just my brain speaking now. Um, I just read this last night, actually. It was, it's never good. Statistics that, that talk about uh, parental influence in the homes and, uh, and, you know, mums. I know you rule the homes, right? I, I know you do. But statistics tell us that it is the father's influence, if, if time was equaled out, which sadly it isn't, you know, it, it isn't even possible because we have different roles, but if time was equaled out, father-mother-child relationship, the, 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 the father's relationship has greater influence to change and determine the child's choices. This is what statistics show us. You know, it doesn't mean that one is less than the other. One parent is less important than the other. But there's something about this father-child relationship that has a potential to bring about great influence. You know? And that's especially, and, and especially, you know, in the same article I was reading, it was talking about, obviously, talking, it talks about drugs and it talks about alcohol. It talks about a lot of illicit things. And it says likewise that it is the father's choices um, that have a greater propensity, regardless of the rules that you may have in your home, but it is the father's choices have a greater propensity to justify the use of those things if they see their father participating in them, regardless of the family rules, you know. So it seems that we, God has created us in a way that our influence is so very, very important in the home. Does that make sense to you? you know, it's not something to argue about, is it? 
It's, it, it really isn't. It's so very, very important. And so this is our job, fathers, is, is to show our kids who God is, you know. So what is God like, you know? Well, God is love, we say. So true. You know, and, and if we wanted to choose a chief characteristic of God, uh, it's faithfulness for me. Well, he's, well, I think it's his chiefest of characteristics. He is faithful. He's always consistent. He's always kind. He's always present. Isn't that true? People ask me to pray for someone. In that prayer, it is always, always, Lord, that they would know the power of your presence in their life. Always. Because God is always present. He's always there. And Father, as fathers, we are to be faithful. You know? We are to stand upon the word of God. We are to never, never let go. We are to be faithful in our marriage to our wives. We are to be faithful to our children. We are to, you know, we are to be, we are to be faithful to the church that we, that we bring our children to. We should be growing Christian men, faithful no matter what. That's the best thing you can show your children, the best thing you can do for your kids, right? Because our kids, you know what they look for us, look to us for? They look to us for consistency. I think that's why one, that's one of God's fate chief characteristics is faithfulness. And we should be reflecting that to our children. We need to give them that, fathers. We must give them that. They look to it for us. Fearing God, always walking in God's ways, providing for our family spiritually, being sensitive men, loving, supportive, being, I'll say it again, being faithful. We are so important. No one else can do what God expects you to do for the life of your children. No one. You know? I started out by quoting dear Prime Minister, Mr Fraser. Life was not meant to be easy, but take courage, it can be delightful. And fatherhood is both. It, it truly is. It's not easy, but it's delightful. As the psalmist says, it is a blessed life. And that's who we are to be, to make choices as fathers that convey this spiritual truth to our children. So make choices. I don't want to keep you here all morning because I ramble a lot. But um, make choices, man, that reflect who God truly is, right? Be a man of the word. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I will read this to you and then I want to close with a quote. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a, uh, um, from verses 5 uh, down through 7 are verses that we often quote at child dedications, right? And it's the Lord speaking to Israel, preparing them as a nation. He is their father, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. So again, I'm saying it again, be sensitive, be loving, be supportive and be faithful, be always present. You know what those verses tell us in Deuteronomy? They tell us that every, every situation of life is an opportunity, is an experience to relate it to the presence of God in their lives. When you walk with them, when you sit down with them, when you're walking along the way, when you lay down at bed, in you know, every situation, do you realise that? Because kids, what are they? They're sponges, aren't they? They're asking, they ask some of the most incredibly difficult questions of us. But you know, every single question can be related to, and it doesn't mean we get preachy-preachy all the time, but every single question that they ask us can be related to what God is doing. What God is doing in this world, what God is doing in his people, and what God's promises are to his people. Everything. You know those weird, hard questions that kids ask you when you're out and about? That's what Proverbs is all, that's what, sorry, what Deuteronomy is all about. Answer them with the word of God. Answer them with the knowledge of God. Be sensitive. Be faithful, right? 
most important thing I think I take from this psalm is that we should be everything that God expects, wants us to be, that our children might become everything that God wants them to be. Seek him, honour him, that you might pass it on to your children. Let me just close with this story. We're going to gather around the communion table, but let me close with this story. And you might have heard this before. A little boy, and I don't know how much truth is in this, but the story is, to me is quite profound in light of this passage and the things that we've been saying or I've been saying. A little, fa- little boy sitting with his father asked his dad, he's come home from school and they've been talking in the playground about Christians. And a little boy comes home and he asks his dad and says, Daddy, what is a Christian? And the dad thought for a moment because he wanted to give a good answer to such an important question. Because this dad was raised in a Christian home. He grew up going to church. But clearly it's not, some, it's not a heritage that has been passed on to his children. But he knows the answers. Daddy, what's a Christian? So dad thinks he wants to give a good answer to such an important question and finally he says a christian is a person who loves and obeys god he loves his friends he loves his neighbors he even loves his enemies he's kind and he is gentle and he prays a lot he looks forward to going to heaven and thinks that knowing god is better than anything on the earth That son is a Christian. The little boy sat there, quiet for a moment, and then he looked at his father. He looked at his dad and said, Daddy, have I ever seen one? Hmm. Let us pray. Father in heaven, So much to be said but how wonderful it is to know who you are and to know that you are our Father, our Heavenly Father. We know that you're in heaven. We know that you're worthy of all praise, all glory and honour. You should be worshipped because we know that you're with us. Because we know that you provide for our needs every single day. We know that you keep us, you protect us from the evil one. And we know that your kingdom is coming. And there are so many wonderful promises, wonderful promises for your children. How rich that is, Lord God. How wonderful that is, Father. How much peace that brings to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that uh, we as dads, would not only speak but reflect um, who you really are to our children. Help us to recognise the importance of our presence within the home, the importance of what it is to be not only a Christian dad but a Christian husband, Father, a Christian husband, a lover of our wives, a supporter of our wives, Lord God, someone who recognises that just how important it is to be a tender, supported, loving, supported, loving husband, that we might, as a team, look upon our children and recognise the richness of what it is that we have to give to them, that they might be those olive trees, Father, that take the rich heritage that we have received from our parents, that they would share it with their kids, And on and on and on. And how glorious it would be, Lord God, that the value of this heritage would grow richer and richer and richer with every generation until we all stand before you as your family before our heavenly family, Father. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the honour that we have, Lord God, to simply honour our fathers But we dads, Lord, let us realise 
that it is an honour that doesn't come cheaply. There is a great price attached to it. Help us to be the men, the dads, the husbands, the citizens that you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to take, uh, if, you've, can, if you can stay with us for a few more minutes, we're going to gather around the communion table. Oh, am I in the way? No. Gather around the communion table and reflect upon God's great love towards us. You know, the things I've been talking about today, you know, we as fathers, you know, we are, we are called to be an example. Isn't that something that keeps popping up in the scriptures? I know we talked about it a few weeks ago, that we are an example unto our children. Why are we an example unto our children? We're an example unto our children because they're always watching, right? Remember that? They're always watching, you know, always. And so important that we live with a mindset so sensitive to that reality. They're watching us, dads, you know. It, I think, again, it is... Oh. No, I won't say that. But I think it is true. It is very true. Num more numbers. My brain doesn't work with numbers. But it's, it, it, is so, it is so evident and it's so true that our children learn more by what they see than what they hear. Isn't that right? Now, you can sit down and give them the good father lecture. It has no value at all unless it is supported by the very things that they see from a good father. And so it's true, they are, we are living, walking examples of who God is and who our children deserve the right to see. You know that verse in Proverbs chapter 22, it says, train up a child in the way that he shall go and when he is old he will not depart from it, you know. There's, there's a couple of basic understandings of what that verse is about. N number one, it is believed that, tr you know, train up, that word, when it says to train up, the idea is to, is to give them a good start, right? A child, I think it's the one of the trans one of the one of the one of the translations actually says it's like that. Train up, give your child a good start or the right start. Right? And one thought is that it's teaching the idea because the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom, isn't it? Right? And in the first nine chapters of Proverbs, as you read through it, is God's wisdom from a father to his son. And it's so rich. You know, I I a couple of us have had a most I tell you what, a wonderful privilege. My dad has been gone for over 40 years now, I think. And, um, but every Tuesday for the last, I don't know how long it's been, I have sat down, a couple of us have sat down with a very wise, older Christian man, Jim Bradley. Are you in the room, Jim? He, he, he just left, uh, you know. Every Tuesday here in the church, Jim has walked me and a couple of others through the book of Proverbs, you know. And it's, like been, it's been like a father to a child, you know. And he's taken us through that. We finished, actually, we finished on this last Wednesday. Just finished it. I don't know how long we've been going, but it's been a wonderful privilege, you know. And, and train up a child in the way that he should go. For many believe has the idea that it's talking about the fact of that, you know, there are two ways that a child can go. There is one way, which is of wisdom and righteousness, and the other is that of the fool, the way of the fool that is referred to all the time, and unrighteousness. And so we've got a choice. We can train up a child one way or the other, right? The other thought about that verse, is when it says train up a child in the way that he should go, and he will not depart from it when he gets old, has the idea that it's talking about we should take the time as fathers to discover what the way of your child is. Because every single child is unique, aren't they? 
You know, and, and it is pointless to try take a child who is, you know, who's leaning is towards, uh, who's leaning towards physical things, and and given towards, you know, has that obvious sort of gifting, and try and force them into the, you know, the the symphony choir or something like that. You know, uh, pointless, isn't it? And so, so the so the so the, so the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, could well be, could this is the other thought could well be saying, find out who your child is. Take the time to discover who they are and train them up according to their distinctive bent in life and they will not depart from it when they get older. You can take it either way, those verses. You can take it either way. The bottom line is both understandings of that verse teach us you've got to know your kids. You've got to take the time to know them, to instruct them and to raise them up and the way that they should go so that when they get old, they will not depart from it. The promise of the verse is not that, you know, the, that you know, they won't have troubles or leave or wander off or any of that. But the, pro- the promise of the verse is that if we do this, if we do this, they will discover in life the purpose of life and the truth of life that will endure with them throughout the days of their lives. And it's giving, and it's giving the Father almost a, a, you know, a, a, an image into the future to see their child as an old man or an old woman who knows the truth of God and is trusting God. It's a wonderful, wonderful proverb. It's about time, isn't it? That's what it's all about. And we say we don't have enough time. But every single one of us has the same 24 hours. We know that. Father in heaven, we stand in this place and we're reminded of a father's love for his son and the great sacrifice that was made for us that we might know you as our heavenly father. And the longing that you have for your children to know you and to walk with you, to be with you. In this room today, I am sure there are some fathers, some mothers, whose children are not with them, not walking with them, maybe even estranged from them. And today is a hard day. I pray, Father, that you would be the God of comfort to these people. But I also pray, Lord, that you would go to that child even now, Lord. And that your presence, Lord, would minister to that child's heart. And you are the God of restoration. And that you would restore these relationships, Father. Do what only you can do. Equip the parents to be who only they can be. That family might be restored and strengthened. And the heritage might be enriched, Lord. And for the rest of us, Lord, who, Lord, are in this place, and we will take this day to remember of the great blessing that we have. I just pray we'll be reminded of that. And where we have the opportunity to honour that man, Lord, may we do so. We thank you for all these things. And so much more that we know is only available because you, our Heavenly Father, have made a way. We pause, Lord, now to remember the death of Christ that brings the victory, that sin might be forgiven, that hope might prevail, and the promise would be to all men. Thank you for these things, Lord. Give us the strength to be the people you want us to be. We take this bread together to remember a sacrifice made that we might be all that God wants us to be. Let's eat the bread together. And we thank you, Father, for a cup that reminds us indeed that our sins have been forgiven and that you've made a way for us not only to know you, but to restore relationships. I pray that this Father's Day, relationships will be restored, that forgiveness will, Lord God, take place. 
Thank you for doing these things for us, we pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, precious Jesus. Let's take the cup together. Amen. Happy Father's Day.